With that, I welcome Frank Gardner OBE, a veteran, veteran journalist and current BBC security correspondent. He has previously served as the BBC's Gulf correspondent and Middle East correspondent before shifting to specialize in stories to cover the war on terror. In 2004, he was unfortunately shot six times at close range while on an assignment in Saudi Arabia, an attack which left him severely wounded and dependent on a wheelchair. He is the author of three best-selling books and an avid bird watcher, all of which we will discuss tonight. And with that, I welcome Frank. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much, Geneva. God, the word veteran journalist makes me feel and sound so old, but um, you know, hey, well, I'm fine, whatever. Um, it's great to be speaking to you all um, as a student who tried and failed to get into Oxford University to read Arabic and Islamic studies. It's always an honor to, uh, to address you now. Um, I was lucky enough to get into Exeter University to, to read that. And at the time in the 80s, that was the only university in Britain that was sending undergraduates away for a whole year abroad. All the other universities said, well, it's kind of up to you to find something to do in the summer holidays, get a job in a shop in Abu Dhabi or something. But for us, we had a whole one year program in Egypt. And I'd really kind of probably taken the decision when I was about 16 that I wanted to learn a really unusual, exotic and quite difficult language, Arabic, um, and the whole culture that goes with it. I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with it, but I thought there'd probably be a job at the end of it. And it's just proved to be an absolutely fascinating journey. It was a four year course, year in Egypt. Um, we would have these lectures in Cairo where, I don't know, it was a bit unrealistic. The, the lecturers would kind of invent these scenarios where we were, would be in an imaginary souk. And I thought half a mile from here is the real souk. And I'd rather just be there and absorb osmotically the, the language, the idiom, all the phrases, the accentuation. And Egypt is such a fantastic place to learn language like Arabic because it's so theatrical. Um, Egyptians are just full of life and zest and theater that it was, I spent a year smiling with them. I made so many Egyptian friends, it was wonderful. And there'd always be a big kind of drama about something, what they call a dosha with, I don't know, Egyptian shouting, well, I'm shouting of them chakals, isn't that? Like you think, oh my God, this person's really annoyed, but actually he's just kind of letting off and steam and having a bit of, bit of a laugh. And it really is, it's a place that is incredibly dear to my heart. Um, I went on to, I wasn't really sure what to do once I graduated and I kind of drifted into banking where I was probably a round peg in a square hole and eventually ended up doing news, um, which is what I've really enjoyed, been enjoying doing for the last, God, 25 years. Um, and that is just endlessly fascinating because it's not just about the hard news, what's happened today and so on. It's about trying to get under the skin of a country, uh, of, a, of a culture and explain it to people. And one of the things I often say to people is that don't be fooled by what you see on the world's news media about the Middle East. If you haven't been there, you you know, people probably think, oh my goodness, the whole region is permanently up in smoke. No, it isn't. Of course, there are some dangerous parts of the Middle East, but I often say to people, a funny thing happened in the Middle East today, absolutely nothing. People got up, they had breakfast with their family, they went to work, they sat around, they did some work, they had some coffee, they chatted to friends, they came home, they had dinner with their families, they watched a bit of TV and they went to sleep. And that's the normality of life for most people in the Middle East. And actually most people there pretty much want the same things that we do in this part of the world. They just want to live in peace and security and raise their family in a nice place. So I've probably said enough of introduction, but look, you know, Geneva, if you want me to carry on, I'm a broadcast journalist. I could keep you here till midnight, but I'm not gonna do that. So far away with your questions. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm really interested to start from the beginning because you've had quite an extensive military uh, career. You were commissioned into the military as a second lieutenant in 1984 and you became a major of the Territorial Army in 2006. So I'm really interested, what drew you initially into military service? Well, I don't want to overplay this because I was a reserve officer and I never served in any of the Middle Eastern wars. Let's be clear on that. You know, the um, military service has changed beyond recognition. So when I did it, I did it as a reserve Cold War 
Um, you know, it was the Cold War back then in the 80s and 90s, and we spent a lot of time digging trenches. And I can remember like we were dug in in Germany and we were billeted in this barn and all the roads, German roads were full of these trabits, these East German cars that had escaped because the, the Berlin Wall had been punctured and they were escaping across to the West. I remember the German farmer came over and he said, right, you lot, the Cold War's over. You lot can piss off back to Britain now. Um, his words. Um, but I did it really because of the fitness. Um, it was a fantastic way to get really fit and to mingle with a really brilliant set of, of people. Um, you know, if you're humping a pack on your back and you're striding across Dartmoor and it's cold and it's wet and it's getting dark and you're getting a bit lost and you've got a dozen, a dozen blokes saying, you know, where are we boss? And it's a great level of that. It really doesn't matter where you've come from. It's all about what you can do. And that fitness, that, that sort of sense of endurance um, stayed with me and probably later saved my life when I got shot because I learned a new word after that. The surgeon who saved me said um, that my cells had good protoplasm, which basically means that they were in good nick. And he said, look, if you were, if you'd been shot as a sort of 50 year old lifelong smoker and been a bit of a fat knacker, you probably wouldn't have survived. Again, his words, but um, because I was running um, at weekends and stuff and I'd done all of that stuff earlier, it, it probably saved my organs from packing in. But, you know, that's not a reason to necessarily, uh, you know, you, nobody expects to get shot six times. So there are other reasons too. It's really the camaraderie as well. Uh, that, that sounds incredible and definitely seems like it prepared you pr probably not in a way that you expected, um, but a way that obviously was definitely worth it. In kind of in stark contrast to that, at, at a similar time that you were you were serving or in reserve service, you were investment banker uh, in the Middle East. Um, I'm kind of interested, why did you choose to do this as kind of the, the other dual career? They seem quite contrasting, quite different in terms of phys like physicality, et cetera. Well, not really, because I was hired by a firm ultimately called Flemings, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was a Scottish investment bank, where there was a kind of bit of a mafia in that firm of ex-Scots guards, officers and, and others. The head of HR had been the RSM, the Regimental Sergeant Major, and he ran that place like a, reg like a battalion, basically, and everyone was scared of him. Um, my boss had, had served on Tumbledown, Mount Tumbledown during the Falklands, the guy who, uh, who then trained me up and who I then took over from in Bahrain had been a cavalry officer and had served in Oman. So there was quite a kind of military tradition. And I think one of the reasons for that is because the job that I had in Bahrain was essentially quite a lonely job. It involved um, really bouncing around the whole region, all six Gulf Arab states, um, marketing fund management, basically knocking on a lot of doors. It was a lot of late night meetings, a lot of time spent on your own in airport lounges, in, in hotels, in waiting rooms, waiting to see the Mr. Big to get that contract. And you need a certain amount of longevity, a lot of kind of endurance and patience for that, because often you finally get in to see the right person, the sheikh, and he'd say, excuse me, I have to take the call. And you know, and like you wait patiently, and, and then he'd, he'd say, I'm very sorry, I have to leave now. And it's almost like that was a test because, you know, if you were to say, oh, for goodness sake, you know, you've just wasted half an hour of my time or whatever, you're never going to do business with them. But if you just take it on the chin and say, well, no problem at all. Look forward to seeing you next time I'm, I'm in town. And I loved doing business there because they really enjoyed the art of the conversation. Um, people that I dealt with, that I did business with there in the six Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, UAE, Qatar and Oman, it was really, it was done on the basis of human relationships. If you just go in there and say, right, here's a portfolio suggestion, you know, we want to sell you this, that you're, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to build it up over a series of several meetings. And I learned a great bit of advice from my predecessor, Rupert Wise, who taught me, he said, always leave a meeting with them thinking that they've learned something from you. It might be a joke, an anecdote, a bit of information they didn't know, but that way they will want to see you again the next time you're in town. And I think that's really good advice. That, that sounds like an incredibly interpersonal based role 
particularly for a corporate sector based job. Do you think that's vastly different from your knowledge of, of how British corporate sector works? Do you think there's a, a difference in the way that, for example, maybe businesses made in the Middle East compared to the way that it's made, made over here? Yeah, it's, it, it's not the Western way, that's for sure. Um, and I found this out actually halfway through my time there based in Bahrain. Um, I happened to be in New York for something and I went to see, um, I went to see a client in New York and I started the meeting in a kind of typical way that I would do in the Gulf um, by having a bit of chit chat, a bit of, you know, perhaps throwing in the odd joke. And the guy started looking at his watch and he said, listen, Frank, you've got 15 minutes. You've just wasted seven of them. Get to the point. And that was a bit of a culture shock for me. I'd forgotten, you know, okay, it was New York, which is sort of has its own way of doing things. But it was, it was a reminder to me that, you know, how pleasant it can be actually to have those sort of conversations in the Middle East. People do business when they like you. And even if you, if you lose money, if the markets go down and you lose money for them, as long as you go in and see them and don't just abandon them, um, then, you know, they ultimately forgive you. And what I used to do, Geneva, was, um, I mean, you know, I wasn't a natural banker. I'm not actually particularly interested in figures and money and accountancy. So that was great. That was the day job. But what I would do is I would have meetings, say, in Riyadh and Jeddah, and then I'd tack on two days, fly to take a little domestic flight, go to a really remote part of Saudi Arabia on the Yemeni border, and I'd just go hiking up in the mountains. And I'd wander for days around these unexplored parts of Saudi Arabia, really wild places where people were still wearing flowers and garlands in their hair and had curved daggers in their belts and gun, you know, gun cartridges across them. And it was just a thrilling part of the world where you could see these successions of ridges in the blue haze of heat receding, going all the way down to the Red Sea coast and beyond to Ethiopia and Eritrea. That was kind of exciting. I loved doing that. That, that's amazing. It really seems like the dual career path you took enabled you to kind of do those explorations you wouldn't have had otherwise. I'm interested that you made the switch to journalism in, in 1997. You became the BBC's first Gulf correspondent. What encouraged you to make the switch to journalism? What drew you towards kind of going from, you know, that, that quite an interpersonal uh, career to, to more of the reporting side? Well, basically, I was fired um, <laughs> I, in the nicest possible way. Um, I'd done my dash in banking. I actually left in 95. Um, I was offered to return to, to Bahrain, but I'd kind of done that. And I'd gone as far as I was going to go, Geneva. I was surrounded by people who were far more interested in money and figures and accountancy than I'm ever going to be. So, um, you know, I, we left, I left gracefully and I retrained. Um, I put my, I wasn't exactly quite sure how I was going to get into news. But I thought, right, I've got to go on a really steep learning curve here. So I got a copy of Floodlight magazine. I found out all the courses that I needed to do. Um, I went on a radio production course at Morley College where we had to produce this little one minute or two minute items on rollerblading. And you had to interview people and use sound effects. And this was all new to me. Um, I was told to, um, to go and rec to record the Today program and, uh, and then to bring it in the next day and discuss it. I overslept, I, I missed the whole thing. Um, so, um, you know, I wasn't necessarily that good at it, but, but I learned a great deal. And I was able to get a two week unpaid work experience um, attachment in the newsroom at BBC World. And they made it very clear. They said, look, don't think there's a job at the end of this because there isn't. But I eventually picked up freelance shifts. And this would be my advice to me, but to anybody who's trying to, trying to get into this business, because there are far more people trying to get in than there are places. And the whole media environment, the whole media scene is changing, you know, at, at a frightening pace. Um, you know, when I was there, if you wanted to film, well, you had to, you had to go and get a decent video camera, a CCD camera. And these days, you know, I do a lot of the filming on the phone. You know, I'm not gonna mention which brand it is, but you can probably guess, you know, we have begun and ended entire 23 minute films that, um, that have gone on air, which I filmed on the phone. Um, so it's not, you know, these days the kit is there if you know how to use it. So yeah, I, I spent two years in the newsroom, learned the ropes, sent myself on trips to places like Sharjah, Iran, Oman, Bahrain, brought back features, and then eventually made the jump to move to Dubai, which was scary because 
there was no job there. I just went completely freelance and in the hopes that I would get enough material to, to live on. Exactly. I, I guess following following September 11, you did you kind of made a shift towards specialising in, in the fight against terrorism. How did you notice the presentation of, of your reports or the way that your um, reporting was perceived change following following the beginning of the war on terror? Well, first of all, I can't stand the expression "war on terror." Um, I, I know it's not yours. Um, you know, this is it's a legacy of the whole George W. Bush kind of idea of you're either with us or you're against us. You can't divide the Middle East into to black and white. You're with us or you're against us. It's a, it's a place, it's dynamic. People's opinions change from one day to the next. How they feel towards their government, towards the West, towards anything can change from day to day, just as it can here. And I think one of the things that annoys a lot of people in the Middle East is when they all get lumped into one basket. What do the Arabs think about this? Well, that's like saying, what do the Europeans think? I don't think the same way as somebody in Luxembourg or Lithuania thinks. Um, you know, we don't, we can't all be put in the same basket and it's the same in the Middle East. But that said, I mean, to answer your question, I think there was a huge watershed on 9-11. It, it did certainly, I think almost more than my own experience of being shot in 2004, it divided the Middle East into before and after 9-11. Before 9-11, it was that much easier for someone like me as a young, single, male traveler, backpacker, to simply backpack around the Middle East, places like Algeria, Sudan, Morocco, Yemen, and be pretty much accepted with great kindness and friendship and generosity and hospitality by people. And I lived with the Bedouin in Jordan, in the Bene Hoytat tribe, near Aqaba in the mountains between Aqaba and the Saudi border. I lived with them for weeks, months, and I fasted with them, I feasted with them, I shepherded with them. They trusted me going out into the desert with their 17 year old daughter, you know, shepherding 80 sheep and, um, and goats. And it was, it was a really magical time. It was almost like a biblical scenery there. I was, what was I, 25 at the time. And I went back after 9-11. Admittedly, I had a couple of friends with me but that same tribe that I'd stayed with were not as welcoming. Um, now, that may be because I brought people with me and it wasn't just me, but I think it was, I sensed that the Middle East had changed. You know, there was, an, uh, in the early 2000s, for a long time, there was a perception that 9-11 that wasn't really Al-Qaeda's work. This was the joint work of the CIA and the Israel Secret Intelligence Service, the Mossad, and I'd say, well, why do you think that? Because it's an excuse to wage war in parts of the Middle East. And that is a firmly held belief, or it certainly was for a long time. Um, and that does put a barrier up for you as a Western traveler. It's better now. And in fact, it's probably gone back to what it used to be. But I feel very privileged to have gone around so many Arab countries and been accepted in the way I was. I didn't represent anything. I didn't represent any government or you know, this is, not when I was banking, this was John, I was just traveling for fun. And for me, I think it's sort of, there are people who spend time in the Middle East because it's their job, but there are also people who go there because they love the region and they're interested in it. And many of my colleagues have spent a lot of time in the Middle East, in that culture, because they simply enjoy being there and they make good friends there. You, you seem to view the, the Middle East with very, very golden eyes. And that's incredibly impressive for someone who, who has indeed been shot six times uh, in Saudi Arabia in 2004. And from what I, from what I know, it, it seemed to have left you with such immense uh, emotional and, and physical pain, a lot of which I, I know you still endure today. How you often talk about you, you didn't realize when the experience was going on that you were very close to dying. You were only told afterwards. How does someone go through that experience? Well, with great difficulty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't recommend being shot. It really hurts. Um, I was very lucky to survive it. Um, I mean, no question. I think the, the, the sort of endurance training that I had done with the Royal Green Jackets years prior certainly prepared me for the life and death scenario that I had lying there bleeding to death internally from those gunshot wounds. Um, and it kept me alive long enough to be taken to a hospital 
where I was saved by a brilliant South African surgeon. But you're right, I mean, I was in hospital for seven months and I had to definitely sort out in my mind what had happened because I had spent years in the Middle East. I had studied, um, I'd studied Islam, I'd studied the, the Quran, the Hadith, the sh Sharia, um, all of these things. And I thought, wow, my reward for this, for trying to understand all of this is to get six bullets in the belly, this isn't right. But I fairly quickly worked it out that the people who had attacked us and who killed my lovely Irish cameraman, Simon Cumbers, they were fugitives from their own society. These were criminals, nothing more. They'd murdered Saudis, they'd murdered Muslims. They'd inflicted pain and misery on plenty of other families. So, you know, it was just bad luck that we crossed their path. That's all it was. Um, and I had wonderful messages of support and sympathy from, um, from Muslims all over the world, from Birmingham to, 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 to Mecca. And, and that was wonderful actually, um, having that. So, um, yeah, I, and I of course had to explain it to my children as well, because I never would want them to be in any way Islamophobic. So um, the investigation was done. There was a joint Saudi-British police investigation and all the people who, who attacked us are all dead now. They, they've, the last one died in prison and you know, they're all accounted for. I mean, it was, you know, it was just such a pointless thing they did. Um, but yeah, you know, I've had to cope with the fact that I can't walk and you know, I have daily pain, nightly pain, um, physical pain, the nerve, nerve pain in the legs below the level of injuries. So, you know, I can't completely forget it, but I don't wake up each day thinking about what happened. I just move on with life. You've got to do it. I think it's remarkable your ability to separate kind of the experience you had from the Middle East as, as a whole. And I think that's something that's quite unique, particularly as you say, with still having these lasting impacts. Is, is there anything that you do on a day-to-day -day basis when you really notice it or things you find particularly hard, or is it more just kind of a, a, general, a general feeling? Well, I mean, crowd scenarios are not good for somebody in a wheelchair. Um, I mean, these days, actually, thanks to COVID, they don't really sort of happen that much. Um, but, um, but it was incredibly frustrating for me when the Arab Spring burst onto the streets of Arab cities in 2011, because I couldn't really take part in that. You know, I had to be realistic about it. You know, there was no point in my going to the BBC and saying, send me to Cairo, because, you know, I'd be in the middle of tear gas, and you know, that's not a good place for somebody in a wheelchair, frankly. Um, so, you know, I had to just kind of bite my lip and suck it up on that one that was just you know annoying um but no you know you overcome you adapt you improvise you work out other ways of getting around things i've got a, a hand bike so i keep pretty fit with that i still travel loads i went to laos last year to do some writing for my next book um i always try and research the novels by actually going to the country itself and and actually kind of try to get under the skin of it so uh whether it's colombia or armenia or wherever um but yeah, I mean, it, but nothing changes the fact that often I'm kept awake at night for hours by nerve pain in, in the legs, which is pretty annoying. G given how life-changing all, all of that was for you, how did you bring yourself to go back to journalism? Did, did you ever think about maybe giving it up and moving to something else or? Well, my wife at the time, uh, who was a Kiwi, um, said to me at my bedside, said, well, should we, do you want to give all, you know, should we just move to Australia and go and study butterflies or something like that? And I said, no, I really like this news job. I want to go back to it. And the BBC said, what can we do for you? When I was in hospital, I said, I would like a letter, please, saying that as soon as I'm well enough, I've got the job back. I can go back to my job. They produced it the next day on headed paper. And that was a huge incentive to get better and to get out of there. And I went back to work as soon as I could because it's really interesting. I love what I do, it's fascinating. I mean, I have to come up with the ideas for the trips, but you know, when I do them, I mean, like earlier this year, just before COVID, we're in Colombia. I spent two weeks in Colombia um, on a, a film we did called Saving Eden about how Kew Gardens is trying to save one of the last rainforests, um, tropical original rainforests in the Magdalena Valley. And I meant riding horseback for days through these remote canyons and through the jungle, you know, What's not to like? This is fantastic. This is living. This is fun. So by the way, don't think, people, that when you hit 22 and you 
you know, you throw the waterboard up in the air and you get your, your degree certificate that life actually starts to become, has to become more serious and stuff. It really doesn't. You know, there is so much fun to be had still, you know, in working in your work environment over the decades to come. At least that's what I found. You're cl clearly an incredibly avid traveller and your book Far Horizon recounts quite, I would say, unconventional holidays that you've gone on and the myriad of adventures that you've had. Is there one that particularly sticks out to you as maybe the most uh, memorable uh, travelling experience you've had? I think Sumatra. By the way, I'm really impressed. You've done your research. I mean, I expect nothing less from somebody in your position, Geneva, but I'm really impressed. You've, you've really well prepared for this. Um, yeah, so Far Horizons, which was my second book, which didn't, you know, didn't get marketed and promoted much. So it kind of, not that many people have read it. So you're probably the third person to have read it. Um, but it's a kind of, it's about advent, the adventure travels of going to remote places like, I don't know, Djibouti and Sumatra. And Sumatra was amazing. I went there and the, um, with a mate of mine, we traveled in our first university summer holidays. We didn't really have an itinerary. We just landed in Medan and we went, on these long bus journeys down into a place called the Hara Valley. And we, we went to this village. They had never seen any outsiders before, let alone two pasty white Brits. And um, they said, would you like to see the Harimau? And we said like, Harimau, what is that? And they did these imitations and Harimau is Bahasa for Indonesian for a tiger. And it turned out that there was a family of tigers living um, above this canyon up in the forest. So we got up a few days later with them before dawn and we trekked up through and we got to this cave, the edge of this cave, and you could hear this scratching. And that was the female, the mother tiger scratching her claws. And you could smell this really pungent, musty smell. And there were these huge boulders everywhere. And then suddenly somebody started chopping wood and the tigers left, the tiger and her cubs left. And we sort of tiptoed down into this cave really gingerly. And there you could see the raw marks, the scratch marks on the black boulders where she'd been scratching. We missed her by seconds. So I'd never seen a tiger in the wild. Um, and that's as close as I came to it. But yeah, Sumatra was, was pretty wild traveling. Yeah, it was fantastic. I think that's probably much closer than I would really want to get to a tiger. So I think that's an incredible story. You're also a, a really um, avid bird watcher and you were appointed president of the British Trust for Ornithology in 2019. H how did you develop this, this passion? Was that on your travels or was it something you developed uh, back here or? Um, no, it was in Bahrain. Um, I'd, I kind of did a bit of this when I was about 10. I was quite geeky about it back then. I was kind of drawing maps and little breeding diagrams of where the birds were nesting and collecting their eggshells. And I was almost quite scientific about it. I gave it up at 13. I had other things to, do, to, to be more interested in and at school. And I didn't take it up till like years later. And I was, my mum came out to visit in Bahrain. I took her for a picnic and we went to this oasis, this palm grove and this bright yellow bird flashed past, then a bright red one. I thought, I wonder what those are. Turned out it was a golden oriole on migration and the red one was an escaped red avid avid, it's like a imported bird, but it sort of piqued my interest. And I've then some, subsequently kind of developed a love of bird watching in wild places. I mean, it's a wonderful excuse to get out to kind of wild moorland or, or other places. And um, I do a lot of bird photography. I post my pictures on, on Instagram at frankgardner underscore nature. And it's, it's really fun to do. I mean, it's, it's, I don't mind if, you know, I'd rather photograph a, a boring, common, dull bird that we see every day, but in an interesting light, in a good pose. I'd rather that than get some sketchy, hazy photo of some distant rare bird. That's, and I'm, there is a difference, you know, between birders and twitchers. So my, my partner accuses me of being a twitcher, which I'm absolutely not, because twitchers drop everything to cross the country to go and see some rare bird that's flown in. I still haven't been up to Derbyshire to see the bearded vulture that is there.
Well, it definitely seems like that's the next thing on your to-do list. Um, the final thing I want to talk about is you obviously have an incredibly unique and I think rather special understanding and appreciation of the Middle East. And that's really evident uh, in your book, um, Blood and Sand. And, and I guess my question is, given the current struggle that we see in the Middle East with the way that they're dealing with, with coronavirus, do you think it's possible that the effects of there may be more um, disastrous than what we've seen in the West? Or do you think they may track similarly uh, to what we see here? Well, it depends on which country we're talking about. So a country like the UAE, for example, United Arab Emirates, was absolutely ahead of the curve. They retooled their factories very early on to making PPE. They even exported something like 6 million sets of PPE to this country. They, um, they were sort of well aware of it, but um, crowded refugee camps are potentially terrible incubators for COVID. So places like Idlib in Northwest Syria, Yemen, which is still suffering after six years of civil war. Um, these are places where not only are people thrown together in close proximity and therefore, therefore liable to transmit the virus if they've got it, but the health systems have collapsed in most of these places. So, and then of course you've got prisons, um, which are natural incubators for a virus. So um, yeah, there, there are places, I mean, even Israel, which is, has a very well-developed and sophisticated health system has had some pretty, had to institute some really serious lockdowns. And I think in the long term, what this is going to shine a light on all over the world, not just in the Middle East, is on governance, good governance, as in spelling it with an A-N-C-E at the end. Because one of the big factors in the Middle East that drives people towards dissatisfaction, insurrection, protest, it's bad governance. That's what, that's what launched the Arab Spring. It was the fact that so many people, so many millions of people across the Middle East felt that they were excluded from possibilities. Unless they had the right connections, they were simply never going to get a job in any position of power or authority or, or, or privilege, and that life was shutting them out. And that's one of the things that, that propelled the Arab Spring protests. Well, those grievances in many cases have not gone away. They're still there. Much of the Middle East is not well governed um, right now, the preoccupation is obviously with not just COVID, but then eventually trying to get the economies back on track, just as it is here. But sooner or later, it's going to come back onto the fact that people, in many cases, are not well governed. And the difference being is that if they're dissatisfied, in most cases, they can't vote their government out of office. We can in this part of the world, in the West. And all the things that you and I take for granted you know, freedom of association, a free press, freedom of speech, an independent judiciary, a lively media, and a democratic election system is denied to people, to millions of people across the Middle East. And that's why that region, sadly, is being held back in many ways from compared to the rest of the world. G given that, and given the focus that you stress on good government governance and, and the way that the Middle East and individual countries, like you say, are, are tracking now, what do you see as, as the future for, for the region as a whole? Do you think there is a, a potential outcome where we see mass cooperation or do you think that's uh, too far down the line to necessarily see right now? I think the, the age old historic um, Arab-Israeli friction is starting to subside because we've seen the UAE um, and Bahrain um, have normalization with Israel. It's possible that Oman uh, and Sudan, you know, will be signing before too long. Um, that doesn't mean to say that the Palestinians have yet got a fair deal. They, they haven't. Um, but hopefully that day is getting closer when there will be a satisfactory deal that satisfies more or less both sides. The bigger perennial problems in the Middle East, I think, are going to be job creation. You know, I, as you said at the beginning, been covering the so-called war on terror. But Terrorism isn't the big issue in the Middle East. It may seem that way to us over here watching on TV, but the big issue for people in the Middle East is simply finding jobs and um, getting a living. Because certainly in the Gulf Arab states, people are not going to have the same standard of living or the job opportunities that their parents did. They're simply not there. Um, so transforming economies in the way that some governments are trying to do into modern economies where there are jobs for technocrats spilling out of schools and universities. That's the real challenge, I think, is to 
to find meaningful jobs for people to do. Um, and that's, that's in some cases not gonna be that easy. I definitely feel like your your insight and understanding having been in the Middle East for so long um, definitely provides such a kind of well-rounded answer for that question. So so thank you very much for, for also an, an honest answer. Um, I'd like to move now to audience questions. So to everyone, please keep submitting your questions uh, through the Q&A function and please use your name and college so that I can credit you. Um, we have one uh, question from Charlie Hancock from Hartford College uh, who says, you mentioned the media has contributed to a lack of understanding of the Middle East in Western Europe. Are there any particular news outlets or reports which you give, find give it a specially balanced or nuanced perspective of the Middle East? He says, I'm very interested in the region, but had limited contextual knowledge to identify where the stories are colored by a journalist or commentator's preconceptions about the region. Well, Charlie, the one thing that most of us journalists try to avoid is dissing our fellow colleagues, and that includes um, networks. So I feel I'm not going to name names there. Um, but what I would say is that I think um, we've come a long way in terms of international media in the way things are covered. So if you wind right back to 9-11, at that time, Al-Qaeda was sending videos, literally video cassette tapes from Pakistan to Al Jazeera. And initially Al Jazeera would run them. And then very quickly, they realized that this was actually giving propaganda to a terrorist organization. And they did the right thing that they put together like a panel of experts who would then dissect and um, contradict some of the things that Al Qaeda was saying. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. If you're putting anybody on with extreme views, you must challenge them. And if the presenter doesn't know enough about the subject, then make sure you've got somebody who is a subject matter expert who can do that. And I don't know if you remember, but for a long time, there was a, there was a Finsbury Park Imam, um, Abu Hamza al-Masri, a guy with the hook. This is like well before your time. This is like 10 years ago, whatever. And he had a lot of airtime. Um, and he was not representative of mainstream Islam in this country at all. He was an extremist. And actually, he's now serving a life sentence for terrorism in the United States. Um, but if you put somebody like that on TV, and I'm not naming which networks, but if you put them on the airwaves, you've got to put somebody who is an expert in their area to confront their views. Um, and it's, that, that's just so important, I think. On a slightly different note, from George at St. Peter's, uh, he asks, coming from a fellow bird watcher, do you feel that the UK bird watching community is accessible enough for wheelchair users? Or do you think more could be done to improve this? Um, or if not, why? I really welcome that question, George. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, a lot more could be done. I mean, it's, it's not easy. Um, the amount of times that I go off to try and birdwatch somewhere and I find that there's a style that is blocking, you know, a wooden style that I can't possibly get out or get through. Or there is a kind of gate which is just very difficult to get through. Um, there are, as far as I can make out, almost no facilities in a lot of these places around Britain. So it's got a huge long way to go. It's not a wheelchair friendly place for birdwatchers. Now, there are some lovely exceptions, the RSPB and their hides and their reserves are generally pretty good. Um, I've got no complaints there at all, but it's, it's some of the other kind of reserve places, some of the other, you know, uh, wilderness areas where I think no thought has gone into it whatsoever. And of course, it isn't just people in wheelchairs. It's often people with prams um, or perhaps, you know, an, an elderly grandparent who would love to see these places, but can't. So I wish there were better facilities. Kind of moving back from that to, to questions in terms of, of, of the dichotomy between the West and the Middle East that we often see. Vanessa's has asked, do you worry that the same freedoms you mentioned that we might enjoy in the West, uh, where a lack of those freedoms caused the Arab Spring, have been severely eroded here since COVID and that we could see civil unrest as a result? Um, that's an interesting question, Vanessa. Um, I think I'm probably not going to answer that because it will end up on page 72 of a daily tabloid and I will 
um, have to explain why on earth I said what I did. Um, so we are in hopefully a temporary situation with this, one that is affecting the whole world. Um, you know, I've got daughters who are the same age as most of you, and you know, they're weathering it pretty well considering, you know, normally one thinks, oh goodness, I just want to get away from all of this. I wonder where I can go. But pretty much the whole world is affected with this. There's no escape. There's no easy way out with this. Um, and it's really, really difficult because, you know, governments, not just our government, but any government anywhere is caught between the desire to get the economy back on track and the scientific or medical advice it's getting to do quite the opposite. Um, I would hate to be in government now, anywhere in the world. This is a poison chalice to be handed to have to deal with this. I should just say, by the way, completely separately to that, um, and this is a little cheeky because I am, so my next novel that is gonna be out in May, it does involve a biological thing. I started writing this thing in late 2018. I spent most of 2019 researching it, talking to epidemiologists and virologists, and it, the, there was a long lead time on these things. It's coming out in May next year, but it's not about COVID and it's certainly not inspired by COVID. Just putting it out there. Well, talking about your novels, um, Oliver from LMH has asked, what made you want to start writing novels in the first place? Um, well, Oliver, I've done two nonfiction books, um, Blood and Sand and Far Horizons, and there was kind of a bit of a gap of a couple of, because a couple of years, it's quite tiring writing a book, especially if you've got a job already. So you've got to carve out time to do it. And it's often quite a lonely existence. You know, you've got to, in my case, sit in a cafe and sort of close yourself off from other people and concentrate on it. But it's still great fun to do it. Um, my publisher said, how about you write the definitive history of ISIS or something? And I said, oh, goodness, how about I don't? I just, you know, that sounded like way too much like hard work. And other people have done it much better than me. So I thought, no, I want to have a bit of fun with this. When the moment is right, I will know. And I will start writing, doing creative writing. And it didn't come for several months. I was on a flight to LA. We were going to do a, a big trip there, some filming. 11 hour flight, I opened up the laptop and just started writing. I create, I just invented this scenario of a Colombian police patrol coming across a dead body in this damp, fetid jungle. They turn it over and it turns out it's Britain's, the head of Britain's MI6 station in, in Bogota. And so begins the mystery. And I'd written, I don't know, a few thousand words by the time we landed. I sent it to my literary agent and he said, okay, you know, we, can, we can do something with this. It's not there, but we can start something with this. And it's, it's really fun. It's counterintuitive, Oliver, for somebody who works in news, where we work within the straitjacket, the, the tram lines of accuracy and objectivity and fairness, and you would never dream of inventing a quote. This is quite the opposite. I'm going against everything in my news DNA to invent situations that never happened, people that don't live, that don't exist, and conversations that never happened. But you're doing it all, and it's great fun. And it's, it's, you just, you think, shall I kill off this character? No, nah, I think I'll let, let it go on a bit longer. I guess um, I actually have a, a follow-up question to that one. And is, is, do you think your experience um, working in the, in, in the Middle East and reporting, do you think that has formed any of the inspiration for your novels or has given you a greater understanding, particularly when you were working on those interpersonal relationships? Do you think that's really helped you form characters and scenarios? Definitely, yes. Um, I didn't want my first novel to be based in the Middle East because I thought that's what everyone's going to expect. So I based it in Colombia. So Crisis is about a narco plot um, that starts in the jungles of Colombia and ends up in Cornwall and ultimately London. Um, but the second one, Ultimatum, is based in the Gulf and it's about Iran and the Gulf. I can't go to Iran as a BBC journalist, but I could go to Armenia, which is right next door. So I flew there, went, did the research, um, and went to this like remote monastery where I wanted to set one of the particularly bloodthirsty chapters. Um, so yeah, um, and actually the most memorable thing about that trip was on the way back, I had to transit, I had to change planes in Paris and I was on this almost empty plane and waiting for the crew to come on board. And the French, um, the Air France steward came up to me and he said, do you know who that is over there? And I said, I don't know, why who? It's Gloria Gaynor. 
So I got me, I got to meet Gloria Gaynor on the flight back from Armenia. So worth going. Ah, oh, seems like you got it. You got a book out of it and and a great visit. That that's incredible. Um, th the final question I just want to ask you tonight is um comes from comes from someone they they ask what do you think the solution to the current crisis in Lebanon is? And I appreciate that's probably quite a hard question. So I guess if, if you don't know the exact solution, what do you think potential solutions are um, that, we could, that we could go for? Well, I can tell you what the IMF, the International Monetary Fund want, because they've been there several times, is they want Lebanon to clamp down on corruption. They want it to reform its economy so that it, you're never gonna completely eradicate corruption, like you'll never eradicate burglary and theft you know, all around the world, but you can bring it down to manageable levels. And in Lebanon, it's, it's out of control. And that's the problem is that people are fed up with the inefficiency and corruption and bad governance. It's what it comes down to again. So um, that's really, I think, going to be the key to it. I mean, Lebanon is an incredibly difficult situation because you've got all these different confessions as they're called, you know, the Maronites, the Druze, the Shia, the Sunnis, and, you know, the, the glue that holds that country together, that lovely, precious country, is yet again starting to come unstuck. Um, and that's not, what, that's not in anybody's interest, not really, unless you're a warlord or something, you know, you're going to live a short, violent life. So um, they've got, I think it comes down to the economy, um, and it comes down to making um, some concessions from people, and the world wants to help them. The Gulf is poised. To, to give them a lot of help. But of course, they've also got the problem that Hezbollah is very powerful there and is seen by much of the world as a terrorist organization. But Hezbollah isn't just a militia, it's not just an army, it's not just an extension of Iran's influence. It is a part of the political and cultural life of Lebanon. It's embedded in that country. So it's, it's quite a challenge to unravel the ball of string that is Lebanon's problems right now. Thank, thank you very much for that response, uh, Frank. And, and indeed, thank you um, for this entire interview. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've learned a lot about not only the Middle East, but also specific birds. Um, so I'm sure everyone else will really have enjoyed it and learned a lot as well. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time out of what I'm sure is a very busy schedule to join us. Um, thank you ev also everyone for watching. Um, I hope you learned as much as I did um, and I hope you have a lovely night. Thank you.